Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bass and today we're talking crankbaits. Specifically, we're going in depth and we're talking about speed cranking. Crankbaits are one of the very best ways, not only to catch bass, but to catch numbers of bass and to catch giant bass. But there is a big difference between just going out, throwing a crankbait and knowing how to trigger a feed response in a bass. So today we're talking about a technique called speed cranking. And uh, this is something that we started talking about just a few short years ago. And prior to that, no one talked about it. Uh, it's a method of getting a fish to react to a crankbait whether or not they want to eat it. Now there are only a few baits that can trigger a core response like that. Uh, I sat right here on the deck of this boat a few videos back, talked to you guys about jerk baits. Jerk baits are an amazing way to trigger a feed response. Uh, the Alabama rig, a rigging, that's another one of those key ways that you can trigger a feed response in a bass. But the other one, the biggest one to me is speed cranking. You can, when you get good at this, take a bait like this and catch as big or bigger fish than you can catch on giant swim baits. It's unbelievable how well speed cranking really works. So today I wanna to talk to you about the technique, explain how to do it, the differences between it and regular crankbait fishing. Uh, and it's going to require some specialized gear mainly high-speed reels. So we'll talk a little bit about gear, uh, and then we'll talk about a variety of the baits that I use to do it, because this is not necessarily something you can do with every crankbait. In fact, there are only a handful of baits on the market that are really, really good for the technique. So I'll run you through those to make it a lot simpler for you. Uh, let's start out, and then I'm gonna talk to you about hook upgrades, a few different things. I mean, we really are going in depth, but speed cranking, I'm gonna start pulling baits out. And as I'm doing that, we'll talk a little bit more about it. So speed cranking, the benefits of it are that uh, normally when you're throwing a crankbait, you're chucking and winding, you're reeling, you're bouncing off things and fish just sort of eat them. That's great, it works and it works most of the year. But there is a period of time, fall, going into winter, that cold water period where bass are significantly more lethargic. And it is generally thought that you can't really get those fish to react during that time of year. It's hard to get them to lash out at a bait. So most people slow down, they fish bottom contact baits, you know, they drop shot or drag a jig, one of those things. Well, there's a whole nother way to do it. Winter time does not have to be boring. You probably do have to be cold, but it does not have to be boring. You can be cranking and it works. Now it starts in September. Truth be told, we've already mentioned it in a few videos. So truth be told, it's already kicked off. Okay, it's going right now. Uh, when I lived on Clear Lake, every year in September, I would catch a handful of eight to 10 pound fish speed cranking. Before anybody even realized that fall bite was full tilt, it's already going. But it's even better in October, even better in November, even better in December. And for whatever reason, December, January, all of a sudden you're just into giants. I mean, giant mass. And that can carry into February, even into March. And really the only thing that kills the speed cranking bite is that the fish start to spawn. Uh, and then unbeknownst to us when we started, because we used it as a cold water technique, there's actually a really good window for it in the summertime too. So this is a year round technique, but specifically September through February, March is prime time to be doing this. So that's why we're talking about it right now. Let me pull out a few more baits here. So the concept here is when you're throwing crankbaits, 
most people throw shallow crankbaits on like a six to one or a seven to one and they throw their deep diving baits on a five to one or a six to one that's the the average angler right that's all well and good because it's easier for you like if you've ever tried to throw a 10 xd you know that on a five to one you can just sort of wind that thing on a seven to one you're like you're doing everything you can to turn that handle and on an eight to one it's almost impossible well spoiler alert we typically throw it on a seven to one or an eight to one not to say i don't throw it on a five but i throw even a 10 xd on high speed reels a lot now when we get down to these mid-size baits it's all high speed it's all seven to one and eight to one so i use a lot of shimano so in shimano that's called a, an hg which is a high gear that's a seven to one or an xg which is an extra high gear that's an eight to one so hgs and xg reels uh it's all about moving fast so the concept is burning a crankbait deflecting off color off of cover and using a stop and go so burn 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 pause tim jokes about this in videos and People joke in the comments because we say burn, 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 pause so often. This is where it came from. It came from speed cranking. The way you do this technique is burn, 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 pause. Burn, 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 pause. Burn, burn, pause. You just start mixing it up where that bait's going full speed and then it stops. Full speed stops. If you're, st if you're hitting bottom, when it hits something hard, you stop. So if it's just grinding bottom, you're burning. But if you feel it really clobber a rock, stop. Let it float back. That's when those fish just crush that thing. It triggers a feed response inside of those fish and they can't help because of the speed of the bait, because of how fast it's going past them. They cannot help but run after it. And then when it cold stops in their face, they're now met with a bait that they were going full speed to catch up to and they just clobber it. Unless something is truly wrong, unless they get there and the color is just terrible or something like that, they're going to clobber that thing, whether they like it or not. And then when you really get your colors dialed in and you really get your technique dialed in, you'll have these fish coming unglued for these crankbaits. It's unbelievable. I've had fish in water in the high 30s because i'm sure by now some of you are like that's all well and good but my water my water gets cold it's already full-blown fall here i'm up north my water freezes i've had water in the mid to high 30s and i'm speed cranking in 20 plus feet of water actually the boat was out over mid 30s the specific time i have in mind and i'm calling fish all the way to the boat they're coming up within three feet of the rod tip and we're whipping that rod around doing figure eights and those fish are eating in water that is in the 30s that's what i'm trying to explain to you i want to convey this message that winter time does not have to be boring winter bass fishing can be all bundled up holding a spinning rod catching some fish it can be that but it can also be ditching your jacket because you're so hot because you are cranking that handle and you're catching big ones so this winter this fall right now you should be wrapping your mind around speed cranking if you're not already doing it it flat works now again it requires some specific baits it's tighter actioned baits unless you're making consistent bottom contact. So I essentially use three baits to do it. Okay, there are tons of crankbaits on the market, tons of great crankbaits on the market, like the 6XD, the 10XD, the Azuma that I like so much. Those are fantastic baits in the summertime. They're fantastic baits if you wanna slow wind them in the wintertime and just dredge deep, but not for speed cranking, because when you're going that fast, the wobble of those baits is too wide and it does not get the same response out of these fish. Okay, these baits are tight actioned, they're charging hard, they're charging fast, they dead stop and it just gets that core response. So three primary baits 
I'm gonna talk about the Mega Basses first, and then I'm gonna talk about the one that Tim and I specifically designed for this, okay? So let's run through baits first. How do we wanna do this? Let's talk about baits first, then I'm gonna talk hook upgrades, then rods and reels and all that stuff. Then I'm gonna talk about the where, the why, the how, like the specifics on what I'm looking for when I'm speed cranking. We'll wrap up with that stuff, okay? Uh, because by then I will probably be all charged up from talking about this technique and uh, willing to just spill my guts on the subject. So, kicking it off with baits. I've, I've already said several times that it takes a special bait. These baits, these are Mega Bass, so these are Deep X 300s, okay? It's a relatively small crankbait. Deep X 300, couple of my favorite colors there. This is a Deep Six. Another great bait for this technique. And then the last one is ours. So let's start out here. A Deep X 300 and a Deep Six. These are very tight action baits. They dive hard. When you're cranking them, they dive really hard. In fact, the Deep Six dives the hardest. It will really get down and dig. Uh, but they're so narrow that you can go really, really fast with them and they'll stay perfectly tuned and they run really, really tight. These are a fantastic bait for this technique. When do I use one over the other? Well, the downside of speed cranking is that you can only get so deep, right? Because what I found is when the baits get too large, the action gets too wide and it's just not as effective. So the deep six is about as deep as I reach with the speed cranking technique. So if my fish are down deep, I'm throwing that deep six. Let's say they're shallower than, if they're up to about 13, 14 foot, I'm catching them on a deep X 300. If they're a few feet deeper than that, I'm throwing that deep six. Okay, those are how I use them. I found personally speaking over the years that I will get more fish on the deep X 300. I catch a lot of fish on that bait. But I've also found that there are a lot of times in winter that the fish are just a little deeper than that, just a touch. You know, and I'm already down to cranking on 12 pounds straight fluoro, trying to get that bait down there. I don't wanna go too much lighter because I'm catching giant fish. If I go down to like eight pound, I'm afraid I'm gonna break them off. So instead I go to the deep six and I gain those few extra feet. I tend to get a few less bites, but compared to each other, I tend to get a few less bites here, but because I'm reaching deeper, I'm getting two more fish, so it works out. Uh, I've caught double digit fish on both of these. Double digits, 10 plus pound fish on both of these. Uh, the other nice thing is here are your size four hooks, here are your size twos, which is pretty nice when you're talking about hooking giant fish. So I can reach a little bit deeper, I've got a little bit bigger hook, it tends to get bit a little bit less from the same groups of fish, here, if they're in this wheelhouse, if they're up shallow enough to do it, I'm throwing that one. It's that simple. Now, there's a third bait, right? Most of the time when I speed crank, I'm speed cranking with our bait. This is, we, we partnered up with River to Sea, created the River to Sea Tactical DD75. Now, the reason that we did this is that there used to be some other baits on the market. There were some other really good options and they've just faded away. And the reason why is that most of the baits are, that are really good for speed cranking aren't the best in the summertime. So people would buy them just as a crankbait. They wouldn't work all that well for what they had in mind. So they lost popularity and they fell off the market. I think that the Deep X 300 and the Deep 6 survived because Mega Bass uh, being a JDM brand just has that core following, right? So they were popular, they stuck around because there are so many committed Mega Mask guys. Um, even before guys realized that you could speed crank with them, they were cranking them around grass. Uh, but a lot of the other good baits had, had come and gone. So Tim and I created this bait 
trying to create the best of both worlds for ourselves. We wanted a bait that would get down hard, that had the perfect action, the perfect sound, perfect vibration, um, and came in very specific colors that were very important to us. And then the other thing that was really important to me was that the bait could deflect off of cover because we speed crank a lot, given a choice, on rock. I love banging it on rock and the nastier the rock, the better. So we created a bait through a lot of trial and error, a lot of experiment, a lot of testing that just deflected better. It just wouldn't snag up as often and we were thrilled with it. So that's this guy. So same scenario, this bait, I can run it on really light line and get 19 foot out of it. But if you hook a fish on that light line, you've got a battle on your hands. So it can't be around heavy cover. Realistically, I'm fishing this bait up to about 17 foot. So it's playing very similarly to the other two. It plays right in the middle size wise. In fact, it's kind of, let me grab all three. And this wasn't intentional. This is just where we ended up. We played with all sorts of different sizes, but size-wise, it's kind of right in between them. Uh, and then just a completely different bill shape, right? And it just deflects really well. But I will say, all three of these are excellent baits for this technique. Uh, there is a time and place for every one of them. And I know that's unlike somebody to, to create their own bait and be like, hey, you should throw that one too. But that's the truth. Tim and I never try to... Uh, like dominate a category that's we're not trying to like get rich making baits or something we created this bait because we knew that there was a hole in the market other baits had faded away uh, and they did specific things that they were really good at and then they were gone and you couldn't get them anymore so we created a bait just like every other product we ever brought to market our a rigs the way they flex uh, the swim bait heads were made to fit in little categories, very specific categories that needed to be filled. That's why we do it. So that's why we did this. Um, and then actually I, I mentioned color. We did some very specific colors too, and I've never talked about this. So I'm just gonna take a minute and talk about it. Okay, so you've got your two really ghosty colors here. You got glass minnow, and ghost minnow. And here in the light, they almost look the same, but they're really not. Um, here you're, you're a green that fades to a pearl. Here you're a green fading into a purple with a little bit of yellow that fades to mostly clear, but very ghosty colors. And those are sort of your clear water colors, like all around colors, okay? Then you've got metallic shad. That's metallic shad. And out of the bunch, I throw, I'm just speaking the truth. I'm just telling you exactly how I fish. I throw metallic shad the least because most of the lakes that I speed crank on uh, just have a lot of clarity. They're pretty clear lakes. So I lean to the ghostier colors, uh, but we knew metallic shad was just, it had to be there. You needed a solid bold colored bait, but we didn't want it to be bland. So we made it reflective uh, so that if you had a little bit lower visibility, if it was a, a lake that had, you know, three to five foot of viz in it traditionally, or even less, that you'd have a solid bold color to catch those fish. It's also by far the best color if you're doing it in the summertime. Then from there, we have the two reflective baits, DD minnow and mirrored minnow. These two are actually my personal favorites, okay? So both of these are ghosty colors, very different, right? Like a brown, almost an olive, and this one's a blue fading to a greenish chartreuse. But then they both have chrome on them, a ton of flash. These are your core baits if the bass are on shad or other really bright bait fish, okay? Because bait fish, some of them when they roll, just don't refract a lot of light. That's where your ghost colors play. But if they refract light, like a shad will just throw light in the water. Uh, that's where you want those reflective, flashy colors. So DD minnow, that by the way, stands for double digit minnow. In case you were wondering, DD minnow is the sleeper. Like that's the one that more people should throw than they do. 
it flat gets them. Uh, Tim and I both have fish over 12 pounds on that color. Just, just saying, it's a really good color. This one, however, mirrored minnow, as I have traveled around the country, is by far my favorite reflective color. Like one lake to the next, that seems to be the one. That's the one, if you guys pay attention, when I just pull out a rod and start speed cranking on whatever random lake, wherever in the country we are, that's the one that I have tied on. Now, if I know I'm on them, a lot of times you'll see I'll switch to that DD minnow, or if I'm with somebody else, I'll switch them to that DD minnow and see if we can't get that giant bite. But I'll tell you what, as we travel around the country, again, outside of California, mirrored minnow is pretty incredible too. It's really, really good. Then we've got our two craws. One is a blood craw. One is green pumpkin craw. Green pumpkin craw is green pumpkin with a bunch of orange on it. See that orange splatter to it? We got fish jumping all around me here. That is probably the most all around craw color, I think from, from any brand, okay? Uh, and what I mean is not specifically this one, but just a green pumpkin craw. I think if you're going to go around the country and try to find a craw color that can be thrown all the time, green pumpkin is it's pretty dialed, it gets them. Then we added all that orange splatter just to break it up a little bit. And you'll find in a lot, what do I, let me see if I have something else that I could show an example of. Do I have one in here? Like here's a Spro color, if I've got one with me. This color. So it's a solid green pumpkin, but see that just orange shot on the tail? And that one's a little dull. Some of them are brighter than others. There's a brighter one. See that orange shot to the tail? I don't know what it is, but that color just crushes for me. There's something about that little bit of orange mixed in with green pumpkin that just, it just works. So we wanted to do it differently. So we experimented and we ended up with that splattered orange belly and I've been really happy with that. Uh, when I'm fishing around grass, this is my bait. Blood craw for me is more of a springtime color. Um, I throw a lot of those bright reds in the springtime, but specifically, see, you guys don't know the backstory on all these colors. Tim and I worked hard on all these colors. Uh, we tweaked them and fine tuned them, changed little tiny details on them. So this guy, there's plenty of red crankbaits in the market. They're almost always red and black. This is a minor thing, but if you look, this bait is not red and black. It is red and brown. And then we shot it with an orange spackle as well. So it's just a little bit of orange on there. I, since I was a teenager, have had all of my red crankbaits, all my deep diving red crankbaits, repainted as red with brown instead of the stock red with black. Just a personal confidence. It works. So I've always done that to be a little bit different and I felt like it's really helped me. So when we came to market with our own bait and we were doing a deep diver in red, I went, I don't want to do black. I, I want to do the custom brown that I've always done for myself. I want other people to have that. So that's why we did that. You guys have no idea how much little detail is in all of this stuff because we've never taken the time to talk to you about it. I mean, I can really geek out on this. And then the last one is uh, our bluegill color. Let me dig him out here. Hopefully I didn't forget anybody, but this is our bluegill. And we just went, obviously there are fisheries that don't have shad in them. And there you're either throwing craw or you're throwing bluegill, uh, or you're throwing one of those really natural ghost colors. Ghost minnow uh, is the primary one. But we went with a really dull, a really ghosty bluegill, okay? So sort of a green pumpkin back, a little bit of barring, that light orange shot on the belly, and then a purple hue over the entire belly and about halfway up the side. Just a really natural, really ghosty bluegill. We didn't want to do an overdone bluegill. Now the reason why all but metallic shad are really ghosty like that 
is because when we're speed cranking, we don't want these fish to get a great look at the bait. Okay, we want the, the thing to fly past them, them to hear it, to feel it, and to go after that thing, but not have a perfect look at it. It, it just seems to work better if they don't have a great look at it. You want them charging full speed, and then when it stops, they just come right on it, and it's now it's in their face, and it's go time, and they just munch it because it's right there. Uh, it just seems to work better with those ghost colors in general. Uh, now, obviously, that can be an exception with craw because you're down there beating the bottom. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but with my shad type colors, my minnow type colors, I like ghost. Now, again, we did metallic shad as a solid color. Uh, there are exceptions, right? That guy, it's ghosty, but look how bright and bold it is. There are exceptions. This, I love this color, but I like this one for smallmouth. Uh, this one is a solid, but it's still natural toned. There are exceptions to the rule, uh, but in general, ghost will get them to commit better if it's not murky water. Okay, those are my three main speed cranking baits. Like when I think speed cranking and I run in the garage and grab a couple of boxes and head out the door, those are the first things that I have picked up. A Deep X 300, a Deep 6, and the Tactical DD. Okay, now from there, we expand. From there, I've got this box, which literally has written on it, MC60, Wiggle Wart, Rock Crawler, Gordito. Okay, so pretty simple. The main baits in there are Wiggle Warts and Rock Crawlers. And I've been experimenting this year a lot more, and I'm really looking forward to this fall getting to spend more time on that MC60. The other one is the Gordito, and the Gordito is like a miniature version of the others. Let me pull one of these out. So like, oops, drop that one. Here's a rock crawler, there's a Gordito, right? Just a little tiny body, little guy. Just a downsized version, but the rock crawler and the wiggle wart, I would say, are my primaries. Um, but I'm, I'm always branching out. I'm always trying from there. Now, these baits specifically, what I'm doing with them is contacting bottom. So all of this, we're, we're talking fall, right? And our last handful of videos, you know, Tim has been talking about throwing a lot of top water. We're talking about fish schooling in the backs of pockets. We're shallow fishing in general when we take you out on the water with us. Uh, the fish split in the fall. Half of them go shallow, half of them go deep. This is targeting the deeper fish. Now, deep is relative. Sometimes those fish pull out to six to 10 foot. Sometimes they pull out to 10 to 15. Sometimes they pull out to 50 foot. Uh, obviously, the deeper they pull, the less you can speed crank for them. You have to do something else. Blade baits, A-rigs, tail spins, that sort of thing. Uh, but those fish that are a little bit shallower and specifically are on rock. I'm thinking, when I say this, I'm picturing a Highland Reservoir. Um, I'm picturing a Cumberland. Uh, Dale Hollow in California and Orville, right? Something like that. Um, where those fish can get up on a rocky shoreline that is steep and they have access to deep water, but they're still not actually sitting all that deep on said wall. Uh, that's where this style of bait comes in. These are baits that I'm using. I only use them in the crawdad pattern. So I'm using them in browns, oranges, reds, green pumpkins, okay? And in the video description for every single one of these baits, I am going to give you my two or three favorite colors, okay? And realistically, I'll probably be giving you like a ghost, a solid, and some kind of a craw or something like that. Uh, but I'll give you my absolute favorites uh, because I want you guys to go out there and succeed. I want you to get to experience that. But again, with these baits, I focus on craw colors because I'm specifically using them in contact with the bottom. I am 
speeding up the bottom when I'm reel acting. It's down there digging and banging and deflecting because these baits tend to kick wider than my other speed cranking baits. These are narrower, but these are mostly in open water. And I'll, I'm gonna circle right back to that. Uh, but these baits are typically in contact with the bottom. Uh, and as a result, I don't care so much that they're a little bit wider action. Wider action tends to just mean they're gonna deflect a little bit better. Uh, so again, I'm just beating up bottom. When I hit hard, I pause. Burn, burn, hit something, pause. Burn, burn, hit something, pause. And those fish will clobber that thing. And I just experiment amongst those craw colors on a given lake to find my best option. But again, I'm typically focusing in that green pumpkin or something with a little bit of orange on it. That's where I start. Now, circling back, let me answer a question that I get a lot. Do I have to be touching bottom to catch a fish with a crankbait? No. No, you don't. You have been lied to. Is it better to touch bottom with a crankbait? If you are throwing a traditional crankbait at a traditional speed, yes. Bottom contact is better than no bottom contact because the deflection off of things on the bottom is almost mirroring what a speed crank will do. It is triggering a feed response in the bass. That said, when you are speed cranking and you are hauling and pause, burn, pause, burn, 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 pause, you are putting so much action into that bait, I could not care less if you have made contact with bottom. Like I can think of some specific catches. Like I can think of an eight pounder in the middle of winter on clear. Like actually it was in February, the lake had risen. We had a flood. The water was chocolate milk. And I was speed cranking a tactical DD on docks, nowhere near bottom. And I, I can remember this cast. I threw right down the outside edge of this dock burned it down and I was paralleling the outside of the pilings and pausing every time I got to a piling. I wasn't touching anything. Eight pounder, right? You do not have to make contact with bottom. You're creating those breaks, those movements, those kickouts of the bait with those pauses. You're creating that and you can do it in the middle of the water column. Now, I mentioned that our tactical DD, wherever it ended up here, I don't know if I'm sitting on it or I put it away. I mentioned that the tactical DD deflects really, really well off of cover. That is important to note because sometimes I am. Like if I'm fishing rock, I want to be deflecting but there's the half of the cast where, or the portion of the cast where you're on your way down and you'll catch fish there before you ever get down to bottom and you'll catch fish on the way back up as well, especially if you're pausing. And then you'll get those fish that come all the way up and want to eat it right at your rod tip, right on the side of the boat and they will just blow your mind. But again, bottom contact is great, but not a requirement. A lot of bass suspend and you can catch those fish with that crankbait. Now, this is not reserved just for deep cranking. I grabbed these two baits to remind you, I'm not going into it, but just to remind you that ultra shallow cranking, when we talk about going dirt, dirt shallow in the fall and chasing those fish with a square bill, our description of burning and pausing is the same thing. You are speed cranking in less than three feet of water. So it can be adapted with different baits at different depths, okay? But if we're talking, you know, if you if you came to me and said, I want to speed crank and I want to catch a 10 pounder, how deep do I fish? I'm going to tell you to go out there and target those key structures between 12 and 16 feet of water. Because more of those giants are there than anywhere else that time of year in most of the country. Again, it could be a specific lake where they're up shallow or they're down deep. But in general, if I'm going to go out there and gamble on a new fishery, that's where I think I'm going to find my giants. I just think that that's deep enough that they're getting to the edge of light penetration through the water on most fisheries. Uh, again, water clarity impacts that, right? That could move them up or down. But in most lakes, 
getting down to that depth range gets towards the the limit of good light penetration and i think it's easier for them to hunt right on that line okay they can sit on the bottom or near the bottom in general darkness with everything shallower than them slightly backlit and they can hunt very effectively and i think that's why we find so many fish in that range now there are so many other factors that will come into play there i'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole today because we're already down a rabbit hole and we don't need to go down a side one for another two hours but um, in general this is a great way to catch monsters in your lake now one thing i want to talk about is hooks and hook upgrades okay um, all these different baits come with different hooks from different brands in general, if I am trying to catch big fish, which is why I'm doing this, I use a 3X hook. Okay, so owner, this is the, the regular treble hook box that I carry everywhere I go anywhere in the country. It will cover me on giant striper. It'll cover me on uh, swim baits, as well as great big crankbaits. It'll cover me on everything from an S waiver to a crankbait, lipless or deep diver. Uh, or tactical crank, speed cranking, uh, to top waters. It's, it's all in one box. This box just goes with me. Two hooks that you need to know about. Okay, one of these right there. And then one of these right here. This one. And actually, I'm going to get two of these. You know what? I don't even have a pair. I don't have split ring pliers in this boat. We're on my jet boat today. And I don't generally deep crank out of my jet boat. I'm generally fishing dirt shallow out of my jet boat. So I don't even have split ring pliers in here today. I don't think. But I'm going to attempt to just put them on by hand for you. Those were the wrong size. This is the correct size. Let me put those back. Okay, so... Talking about hooks, hooks are everything, obviously. We know that. You don't have the right hook, you're gonna get bent out. You don't have the right hook, you're gonna miss them in the first place. When these fish eat a speed crank, let me grab any one of these baits. The vast majority of the baits that we're using for these types of techniques run size four treble hooks, just FYI. The vast majority of them, okay? Some of them, the bigger baits, will run a size two, like that guy. But generally, size four is going to cover you for most things. If you want to catch big fish and you want to know you're good, this is an Owner ST-56, the ST-56. You don't have to memorize that. I'll link it in the video description for you. This is the hook that I use on everything from topwater to lipless to speed cranking to... I don't know what I don't do with this hook. I mean, I do everything with this hook. This is my go-to hook because it is heavier wire. It's 3X, but it's still thin wire. It's got a slightly tipped in point, but not severe, not like an EWG. It has an excellent hookup ratio. It's really strong. And I just know I stand a great shot of landing my fish if it's a big one. Okay, in fact, these are the same hooks I throw all the way up through all my glide baits and everything. Uh, obviously in bigger sizes, but a size four will do the vast majority of what you need. And then a size two for the bigger cranks. The only oddball is actually the tactical DD 75. It requires sort of an in-between size hook. So I want to be specific for you and tell you what we use. We use, where did I set it? Tim's the one that figured out this was the best hook. I was using an owner ST 56 size two. This guy turned out to be a better solution. See how this hook, this is a treble hook, it's an owner, but do you see that it's not the same all the way around? There's a flat side, okay? Two of them, flat sided. What I do is I replace them with these after I've worn them out. I like the stock hooks and I catch a lot of big fish on the stock hooks, but over time you're gonna wear them out, bend them out, dull them, right? That's just reality. So I switch them to these, and that hook is a STY35MF. Good luck remembering that. In the video description, it'll say 
Tactical DD-75 hook. This one. It's a size one. That's all you need to remember. I'm going to attempt to change these for you without a split ring plier and without bleeding too much. So they're like a, it's got like a Teflon coating or some sort of a slick coating on them. I always bleed when I change these things, but I'm gonna change them for you right now. So in general, if I'm changing hooks, I also change split rings. I go to an owner hyper wire on any brand. Almost all crankbaits will take a size three owner hyper wire, uh, except the great big ones, they'll take a size four. Okay, but generally size three. So stock hook off. Stock hook off. Come on. It's a lot easier with split ring pliers. I should have come prepared, but we can do it this way. We'll get it. I'm just using my thumbnail to pop open the split ring. Now, the important thing is that I want this to end where my back one is up. Okay? So the flat side is faced down on the back of the bait. And it's reverse on the belly, flat side up to the belly of the bait. That's how I want to fish this, okay? Let's do the belly first, because I think that's the one that's going to make me bleed the most. It's just reality here. So I make sure I turn it the right way so that it's going to end up how I want. And if I decide I'm going to really stab myself, I'll just bail out. But I don't think I will. I've done this a time or two. All right, so there's that hook. See now it lays flush to the belly of the bait. Again, it's a size one. It's a relatively large hook. If I was doing this with any other hook, it would be a size two. Take this one, pop it, there we go. No blood or anything, we are in business. All right, so when I go to do an upgrade, that's what I upgrade to. That is not a small hook by any means. But again, they lay up their flush, so they behave smaller than they are. It's just a tip for you. I mean, you can go out and use any hook you want, but that hook, I'm getting away with a whole size larger in terms of the gap of the hook. So when they eat it, I mean, they are in trouble. I have got them good. And I'm getting away with it because of how well it just flushes up and sits there. So stock hooks are great. I fish them all the time. But when I start to wear them out, it's time to change. A lot of the other brands come with 1X hooks that I'll change right out of the package, not because there's anything wrong with them. And if I thought I was going to catch one and two pounders, I wouldn't even worry about it. But I'm not speed cranking for one and two pounders. Now, granted, I'm catching them, and that might be all I catch on a given day. But I know in the back of my mind, hey, the biggest fish in this lake is willing to do this. They'll get triggered. They don't have a choice. They're going to eat this. I've caught enough literal double digit class fish doing this that I just know it doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter what the conditions are. I may hook into a fish of a lifetime right now. So I always take the time to do that number three on our hyperwire split ring and then that three X hook. Just upgrade them right off the bat just know that I'm good because the last thing I want to do is just be out there on a rough day doing my thing, load up on a fish and go, that feels different as that rod full bows. If you've never experienced it, it's going to blow your mind. If you have experienced it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You hit that fish just like any other fish. You get back here and now this rod's going like this. And you look at the rod and you're like, the rod's supposed to look like this. Why does it look like this? Oh no. And then they go, wah, wah. two poles. And what that is, is that fish is eating that bait. You stuck them, but the crankbait rod is so soft. It doesn't even move the fish, right? It just pokes them with the hooks. And she goes, head shake, head shake. Right off the bat, they all do the same thing. You hit them, but you're not able to move them. And they go, and they try to get that thing out of their mouth. They try and throw it. That's their first move, every single one of them. And then when it doesn't throw, the fight is on. So you're about up and you just, you feel that double head shake. You're like, oh no, here we go. And then they almost always come for the surface, unless it's really, really cold water. Up they come and just, just blow your mind. But when I feel that load up and I feel that head shake, 
I want to know that I've got them on a stout hook. That's why I take the time on the front end to always do it right. Take the time, buy the extra hardware. I know it's not cool to spend all this money on crankbaits and still have to upgrade hooks and split rings. I know that. I know it because I also do it. I know it because I have boxes that look like this that ride around with me, right? Labeled trebles. It's in the boat. This is the lamest box in the world to build because there's nothing fun about it. You spend all the money and build the box and then you're like, well, that wasn't exciting. But when it saves your rear end over and over and over again, you'll be glad that you have it. So take the time. There's nothing glamorous about it, but upgrade those hooks, even on those pricey baits. Just know that you know that when your shot at the fish of a lifetime comes, that you're good to go. Because speed cranking is about catching fish, but it is also about catching monster fish. Again, it's one of the few baits that can do that consistently, especially this time of year. It shines now through the winter. You have a great shot at a personal best. And that's all species. That's largemouth, smallmouth, spotted bass. I've even cranked up great big striper. But those three, largemouth, smallmouth, and spots, equally, We'll smash that thing. Multiple double digit largemouth, multiple six plus pound smallmouth, and a bunch of great big spotted bass too. It just gets them. Now gear, let's talk gear, and then we'll circle back and I'll talk about what I'm looking for out on the water, okay? So gear, I've talked in the past a lot about this. Sometimes I throw it on braid to leader, sometimes I throw it on straight fluoro. Uh, Day in and day out, I throw them on fluoro just because it's easier. I can re-spool it quickly. Everything's simple. I don't have a knot banging through my guides. It's just, it's just simple and I can adapt it to almost anywhere and I'm getting great depth. Okay, so I throw, my number one rod is very specific. This is a G Loomis 906 crankbait rod. Very specific rod. And I am that specific. Like, I'm not throwing it on something else. That's what I throw them on. That's what I throw my three main baits on. Okay, that, that's the Tactical DV, the Mega Bass Deep X 300, and the Deep Six are all going on that rod. I've got a Bantam paired up in XG821. And then I've got 12 pound straight fluorocarbon on there. Okay? It's that simple. Now you can also throw an HG. Eight to one or seven to one will be just fine, all right? Um, but either one of those will get them. The beauty of that eight to one is that when they really want it hard, I mean, you can go hard, you can go fast. If you need to slow down, just slow down. Uh, with the seven to one, when you need to go really, really, really fast, it's uncomfortably fast. But if you wanna use it for other things the rest of the year when you're not speed cranking in the winter, seven to one is a better balance. So just know that if it's dedicated, eight to one. If it's going to pull double duty with other things, seven to one. But again, 906, that is a seven and a half foot rod, but it is misleadingly soft in the tip section. Let me get that cobweb off there. Misleadingly soft, okay? That's how I'm getting away with hooking a 10 pound bass on a size four treble hook and getting them in the boat. That's why the rod matters so much. There are a lot of techniques where we're like, well, we use this, but you know, just use a medium heavy, you'll be fine. And then there are techniques like this where we're like, hey, listen, we're trying to help you here. This, the jerk bait, right? The 610 medium X pride. Uh, swim baiting is another one where it's like, you've invested all the time and the money on swim baits, gone out there, tried to hook a massive fish, don't do it with the wrong rod, it's gonna cost you. Speed cranking, don't do it with the wrong rod, it's gonna cost you. Now, there is a budget option. I'm always doing what I can to help you guys. So I'm always looking at different rods, but here's a crossover now, okay? Now this guy, and actually the reel I have on here today is also fluoro, but in general, I'll throw braid on this one. Uh, this is the 845 CBR, still the Loomis, IMX Pro, 845 CBR, okay? This rod is a seven footer, but also does an amazing job. 
Uh, I have caught fish over 10 pounds on this rod too. Uh, it does an excellent job. Now you can fish it on fluoro, but you can also do braid to leader. If I am going braid to leader, let me, let me back up. More and more I throw fluoro, ease of use, comfortable, super long distance, great depth when it's diving, especially that 12 pound fluoro. Uh, it just gets down really, really well. But when it is all about the stop and go, okay? Burn, 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 pause, burn, pause, burn, pause. And every single fish hits it on the pause. Immediately, I switch over to braid. The reason why is that fluoro stretches a lot less than mono, but it still stretches. Braid stretches way less. So when I go braid to leader, when I stop, it stops. When I go, it goes. When I'm using fluoro, when I stop, it slows to a stop. When I go, it pulls to a start. It's not as crisp. So there are days where you'll find that the majority of them eat on the retrieve between pauses. Those are fluoro days. There are days where 100% of them hit it when it stops. Those are braid days. The other thing is that when they hit it when it stops, sometimes you don't feel it, especially with the true giants. Because you stop, now it's slack. A giant will engulf that thing coming toward you. And when you go to reel again, your first two or three handle turns are nothing but slack. And you're like, oh no. And you just give it the hardest hook set you've got. Try to get all that slack out and catch that fish. Uh, so braid really helps with that too. You will feel more of those slack line bites on braid. Now the 845. What I like here is that this is a fantastic double duty rod. It is also an excellent lipless crankbait rod. My favorite lipless crankbait rod. So if I was only buying one rod, I'd buy that 906, mostly fluoro, but I could switch to braid. If I'm gonna have two, 906 for fluoro, 845 for braid. But if you're buying one and you want it to play double duty, Get an 845, you can put either one on it, and you can also use it for lipless cranks, and you will literally own the best lipless crankbait rod there is, and you'll have just a fantastic speed cranking rod as well. The other nice thing is that they make this not only in the IMX Pro, but you can step down to the less expensive line as well, and I'll link that one too. So you have a budget option in the 845. Now last rod, then we'll circle back. I'm always trying to find you guys a budget option, okay? We look hard. I think I've finally got a good one. So this is Mojo Glass, St. Croix Mojo Glass. This guy, 7.4 medium heavy in a glass rod. So glass rods are really limber throughout. So it's a little bit different action. It's not as crisp as the others, uh, but it will save you a bundle of money. And I've been really happy with it. I've thrown it quite a bit now and it loads up extremely well. So you don't want to throw it on necessarily a traditional crankbait rod, a rod that you would throw an eight or a 10 XD on because they're too stiff in the lower two thirds of the rod. They're just soft up in the tip section. We need this rod to really load up throughout to keep those little hooks in a giant fish. Glass rods do a good job of loading up throughout and so far I've been very pleased with this Mojo Glass. Uh, and then I have this one paired up to an SLX XT. So the SLX is a fantastic reel around a hundred bucks. You pay a little bit more for the XT but it gives you this external adjustment that goes a long way, okay? Uh, this has been a really solid option. So I think on a budget, this is, well I don't think, by far this is the best option I've found. Um, you're going to be into the entire combo, uh, what, right around 250 bucks. So now we're not, we're not talking like a cheap combo here by any means. It's still a lot of money, but it's a lot less expensive than grabbing an IMX Pro and pairing it up with a Bantam like I do, right? You're saving a bunch of money over that. Uh, I don't want to tell you to go less than that because I haven't found one that I really, really trust, where I feel like it's not gonna cost you some fish. Uh, that said, I will keep looking. And if I find it, I will tell you about it. So 
let's circle back from there and let's get back to where we do this. Okay, when I'm out speed cranking, again, when I say speed cranking, I'm specifically thinking uh, here, right? I'm not, I'm not talking about here. You already know this is backs of pockets. And we've already talked about all of these guys, the wiggle wart, the MC60, the rock crawler. We're talking about fishing that outside rock steep edges. These guys, the bread and butter of speed cranking. I'm looking for, when I go out on the lake, as the grass dies back, the bass that go deeper gather on rock. That is where they gather. Okay, those fish will bunch up on rock. They will bunch up on ledges. They will bunch up. Now I say ledges, not necessarily current ledges, not necessarily Tennessee River current ledges, but I mean where it comes out and it breaks. Okay, they'll bunch up on that transition. They'll bunch up on bluff walls. They'll bunch up on boulders, rock piles, creek bends, long tapering rocky points. They're on outside structure. Okay, if you're on a highland reservoir, I'm looking out on long tapering points and I'm looking for structure that's out there. So is there a tree that's fallen over out on the end of a long tapering point? Is there a rock pile out there? Is there an old foundation out there? That's what I'm targeting. Those fish will gather on that hard structure and they tend to school, which is awesome because when you catch one, you can catch another and another and another and another, as opposed to just working and working and working for one. So Highland Reservoirs, I'm looking for that isolated offshore structure. Lowland Reservoirs, a lot of times you don't have that. So there what I'm looking for is where bass have pulled to outer edges and it's hard rock. So a lot of times that'll be entrances to creek mouths. Um, that will be, again, ends of big points or tops of humps. You have a lot of humps in those places. So maybe the tops of your humps have rock on them. Maybe the tops of the humps have trees or brush on them. Because again, with a stop and go retrieve, you can take this bait and you can run it right through the heart of a tree. You just don't want to run it up and get it stuck. If I'm running it up and I feel that line start rubbing, I pause and I let it, it'll float backwards and out. So if it's coming up on a branch and I feel that line rubbing because I'm down here below the branch and it's going to come up and it's going to stick. If I feel the rub, I stop. It'll back up. I reel again. I feel the rub or I feel a contact. I stop. It'll back up and on the next one, I'm over the top. I can reel right through an entire lay down tree. No problem. Just takes patience and you'll pluck fish out of those trees. So you can catch them out of the tops of that stuff. Or if you've got a lot of humps that are out on like an old wandering river channel or something like that, where the channel comes in contact with the humps, that tends to be a cut bank and you'll have exposed rock. Those fish will gather and bunch up on those places. If you're fishing a smaller body of water, it might be isolated structure, right? If you're in a pond, it might be a lay down. It might be the rock on the dam. Uh, it might be the picnic table that somebody threw in the lake and you can run that bait down and bounce it over the top of that picnic table. Uh, you're looking for hard structure and the farther into winter we get, the more important that becomes because the soft cover, the grasses will die back and it will leave that hard stuff and the fish will get drawn more and more and more into it. Again, access to deep water is key. That's what makes a bend in a river channel where that rock is exposed so magical because they can immediately bail off into the river channel. That's what makes the tip of a long tapering point so good if there's a little rock pile out there because they can be moved up and they can sit up there and you can crank them. But then if they're in a bad mood or they're not feeding or the weather changes, boop, they just drop over the side. Now they're suspended out over open water. So it gives those fish easy access to somewhere where they're comfortable and safe. Speed cranking is incredible. This is not the first time we've talked about it, but you need to get out there and do it. Take it seriously. This is one of your best shots at catching a giant bass. I know there are a lot of people that don't want to get into swim baiting. It's either too much work, too much expense. Uh, it's hard. If you're an older guy, it can be hard on your body. Or if you have injuries, it can be hard on your body. Anybody can speed crank. These baits don't have a lot of resistance in the water. 
So it's not pulling on you as hard as you think it will to be real in that thing. You can do it. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. This levels the playing field. Anybody can go out there and speed crank, stop and go through cover and catch a truly giant bass. I hope this video helps you guys. Again, in the description, I'll break out these key baits and my key colors for each one of them. I'll give you exact hook sizes, exact rod and reel combos. I want to hear that you guys are out there catching them. For the next three or four months, I hope in the video descriptions, people pop up on random videos and are like, I went out there, I did it, I caught my PB. We thrive on that stuff. I've caught a ton of giant fish doing this. Tim has caught a ton of giant fish doing this. A lot of you have as well, and I hope more of you do this year. If you guys enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon.